Derek Grant's breadth of experience makes you think that he's seen it all. From the jazz tap ensemble to the whirlwind ride that was bringing the noise, bringing the funk, to directing Imagine Tap. But when you look in his eyes, you still see an openness to new experiences and a zeal for learning. He's seen trends come and go, and during the course of this interview, he made a prediction that shocked me. I couldn't or didn't want to get down with what he was saying at first, but then, like a true Pied Piper, tap dancer, he got me on board with an image of what is to come that made me want to practice harder. Extraordinary. The Interviews is a series about survival, how to survive in a life of tap. In pursuit of this question, it is with great pleasure that we sit down with Derek K. Grant. How long have you been dancing? <laughs> How much money do you make? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can, I can play both roles. In Universal Dance Studio, when I was a kid, I come from a class of young people who try to outdo each other constantly. Uh, it wasn't enough to be your best, you tried to be the best. And no one said anything. It was never about bragging, it was never about having to plead your case for why you're the best. You just kicked everybody's ass and let everybody else talk about it and say, oh, that, he's the best, or she's the best, you know. And so that's where I come from. So in a rehearsal situation, I try to always be the best and at least recognize who's the best and then try to get them, you know, not, and, and with no malice attached. Just try to like, you know, if you set the ball, I'm trying to hurdle the ball. I grew up in Boston. Went to my aunt's studio, and my aunt grew up dancing with Diane. And when I was about eight years old, Diane came back to my aunt's studio and, and started to teach myself and my two buddies. She exposed me to this world and these men and this whole other. Diane is almost single-handedly the bridge between like those, the old cat, the cats, and like the babies. Now, I make that statement knowing, you know, very well that I don't get here if it's not for the likes of Lynn Daly, her willingness to, to take on a young talent and train a young talent and get me to another level as a professional. Brenda Buffalino did a lot for young people, ushering them from being students to being professionals. Diane's contribution and connection you know, the older cats trusted her. They didn't trust a lot of people, if anybody. They trusted her. Um, they trusted that what she would do with the information would be beneficial to themselves and to the, and to the overall. Most of my adult life, Diane not only was a part of every festival that existed, but had started every festival, was at least the first faculty member of just about every festival that existed. You know, I'm sure there are a few that fall through the cracks, but I'm, I almost mean that to the T, like literally, you know, she's at the heart of every festival in the world. You know what I'm saying? That is crazy. Any cat between 20 and 45 is calling her Aunt Diane has been practically on her lap learning about tap dance. And certainly a lot of her teachings came by way of Leon Collins and his legacy and his information. Um, but her spirit, her ability to connect with and show compassion for and get young people to trust and fall in love with and have faith in her movement and believe in themselves because she believed in them. It's like a superpower. But you take, you take her out of the equation and I don't know where tap is today. Almost, if not as important than any other figure in the game the last 30 years. If it ain't right, it's wrong. When No 
always ended, I think, emotionally, I think we were all, all over the place. Um, it had such an impact on our lives in terms of who we were as young black men, but also who we were as dancers. And also we were fighting to climb the ranks in the world of tap dance. And emotionally, we were all over the place. I think as a result of going through that struggle and surviving, I think we felt a need to reconsider uh, our approach with the dance. I work my butt off, my chops are straight, I hope you're doing the same or I'm gonna just cut you. You know, rather than come so aggressively, I think we try to really just connect and really just share a positive energy and attract as many people as possible through this uh, positive, healthy, safe climate. That's been going on for a while now. Like a parent to his child, I'm thankful for that to a certain extent. At the same time, I feel like the dance on the whole, in terms of the kind of materials that we're producing, the fact that a lot of people feel like they can be a student, student one day and be on stage you know, the next. And unfortunately, to a certain extent, that's true. But the fact that that's true is not really helping the dance that much. I remember when I was young, you hear stories about cats having to sit in Lacave for a year before they could even think about getting up there to, to and that's a jam, that's not a show. So, you know, the idea of a student developing the skill set to then become a professional and them having a fast track now as a result of this kind of uh, welcoming environment, I think it's kind of made our uh, products a little soft. The time is coming for a darker day. And I try to prepare my students in the way of how they think more so than giving them more steps. You know, they have a ton of steps. I'm inside their head. We expect musicians to know tunes. Right. And, and, and another challenge from Jimmy was like, learn tunes. Like, learn, like don't just call a tune because you heard somebody call it. Learn it, learn the words to it, learn the music, know the tune inside and out. What are you thinking about when you dance? But what are you thinking about when you're preparing to dance? And how far are you willing to take this when you meet a challenge, when you meet that hurdle that seems bigger than life, are you willing to fight and do what's necessary to overcome it or will you surrender? I don't really expect answers from them, but I think that from that point on when I pose that question, I expect them to work with a different level of seriousness attached to it. Because quite frankly, when it does get darker, I'll be worrying about myself more than my students. <laughs> I think because I'm out here creating work, I'm out here trying to be taken seriously, I got the So Dancing sponsorship and all of that, that will be tested. You know, sooner or later, I'll try to do a little marketing campaign with So Dancing somewhere and a cat's gonna be like, oh yeah, if it's real, show me. and Jump on the wood with me. If it's real, let me see. And it's up to me to hold it down and let them know, oh yeah, it's real. Like, you can come if you want to, but you're gonna get cut. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And you know, I mean, people are like, how bad can it get this tap dance? All right, sounds good, but I've been there. You know, I've been there when, you know, cats is bloodthirsty and every jam is not friendly. And, and I'll tell you how it starts, to be quite honest. It starts with private jams. It starts with certain people feeling like they, they don't, they, you know, they're not getting anything out of the big old thing that everybody comes in. They want something very specific so they have their own thing over here. Then the cat hears about it and is like, why not me? How come nobody's hit me up? And tries to get in and they're like, nah. And then that's when it starts to get dark outside. You know what I mean? Because rejection forces us to look at ourselves. Trust me when I tell you, it's been documented here first. <laughs> there will be darker days ahead of us, but that's a cleansing. You know, it's necessary. Um, and I look forward to it because I'm excited about the level that it takes to dance next time. Even in this peaceful time period, I think we've been prosperous. I think that like the average student has a very strong skill set. 
when we go through whatever it is that happens next, I think the dance will just go to another impossibly high place and that will become standard. Listen, some people will never feel it and think that I'm bugging, but those people almost don't matter. It's gonna be the cats that are really trying to trying to push and, and, and leave an impression in the dance. Does, does that mean you have to, you know, choreograph a bunch of shows or, you know, direct a few companies or whatever? I, I mean, there's so many different ways of doing it and I would love to do it all, but I don't think it has to be any of that. What I do think it has to be is your level of commitment to tap dance. Simple and plain, because through your commitment, you attract energy, you attract others who are interested and they see how hard you're working and then they're attracted to that work ethic. It's always about the dance, you know what I mean? And that's, when I say it's gonna get dark, that's gonna be the criteria again. I think right now, you have some people who are clearly amateurs jamming with people who are professionals and we all jam together and it's no big deal and it's and you know it's nice that the the pro would humble himself to dance with the person who's only had two classes and that's all fantastic what is any of that doing for tap dance now you could say it's building an audience you can say it's building interest and I'm and I, I would agree I think you're right but I also think you can do those same things 10 times faster, 10 times more potent with just your commitment to the shuffle of the toes and the heels. If you're kicking ass, if, you, if there's a jam and that jam only has three people, never mind 15 at various levels, you have three or four of the best cats that's in the room at the time going at it, the kind of attention and energy and education that would happen as a result of that, I think is on a whole other level. And I think that's necessary. Do I think that people you know, shouldn't be included? Do I think that people should be left out? No, but I think there's a time and place for everything. I remember being a child and not being allowed to be in certain conversations because I was not old enough yet. The same should be true with tap dance. You know, a jam is a conversation. And certain people are young in their tap years. You're not old enough to be in this conversation yet. Grown people are talking. I don't know people are gonna be mad for me saying so, but I, you know, I'm, I'm excited about it. I think the, the level of the dance is just gonna you know, go to another place and I'm ready for that. I remember at the Colorado Tap Festival, they had a room, like a little movie theater that had footage all day. 24 hour footage and if you didn't have a class, you could go in there and catch a bar of whatever was playing at the time. Imagine if like a festival, you had the band on deck in a room somewhere and they're always just vibing and if you didn't have a class, you could go in there and just shed. Wouldn't that be sick? That'd be cool. Just to be able to vibe with live music every day. It's just a way of life. In order to, in order for me to get the best me out of myself, um, I try to be humble, I give thanks, I say prayer, I practice. I try to eat healthy, I try to be respectful. In all of those choices that I make because I make, I make them because that's the kind of man that I want to be, it's the kind of man I want people to see when they see me. Um, tap dance is a part of that formula. Practice, practicing tap dance is a part of that formula. I think. If you don't practice, your blade just gets dull. You know, I don't really know any other way of saying it. You just, certainly you'll still remember how to do it. It's just not as sharp and not as clean. And that sharpness and that clarity is the point. It's the kind of thing where you come out bursting with fruit flavors and got all kind of ideas for four minutes and then fifth minute you go dry. And I'm trying to just have the kind of mental stamina where I'm as creative in my sixth and seventh minute as I was in my second minute, you know? That takes practice. I also try to practice a lot with eyes on me because I think your commitment to the listener uh, heightens when it's real.
I think watching students grow into becoming professional dancers and seeing the kind of professionals that they are has informed me and changed me as a teacher more than anything else. And I say that because then I take the beginning that much more serious because I see the potential for the, for the end. When I first started teaching, I didn't know enough about teaching. I didn't have enough experience to know um, how special the information was and the potential uh, that I could take somebody with the information. It's not a game. I see somebody who's hungry and who has a, a, a solid work ethic and some talent, I'd give them everything I got. You know, I've always been given things to, you know, whether it was from Diane or I can remember Brenda being kind and giving. I can remember, you know, Gregory, uh, Barbara Duffy, you know, there are all of these dancers in my life who just gave constantly. and. Um, and so I feel compelled to just give. Imagine Tap was a huge challenge. It was a challenge to the world. It was a challenge to my own community. You know, I wanted the world to be able to imagine Tap in any scenario. Stop thinking that tap can only be in a certain box. Tap could be anywhere you need it to be. Anywhere you can imagine, tap can be there. And then I surrounded myself with the craziest tap dancers that I could muster at the time. These were people who were blowing my socks off everywhere, everywhere that I went when I witnessed these people dance. I was just like, what is going on? And so I collected these. These are people that didn't even know I was watching. Some of them I didn't even have a relationship with calling them for the first time they hear my voice. I'm like, you don't know me, but, you know, <laughs> craziness. Uh, the one cat, Ray Hesselink, Mr. Happy was his, his, his character. Um, he was like my curveball, my little surprise. I feel like every show has to have a surprise. Um, I'm on the faculty at Juilliard. This is true. I teach dance there. And it's a blessing to be there because I get to cultivate the next generations of temps and waiters. <laughs> oh my God. Hey, Samantha. Yeah, you graduated last year. Congratulations. Can I have the salad dressing on the side? Thank you. Thank you. He was my way of including musical theater tap dance because I felt like people were so set on separating the worlds and I felt like we're all family. And so including him was huge and he's, uh, so good at what he does, and that was huge. We both taught at Steps, and his class ended a little later than mine, so I can remember, like, for months, finishing my class and walking upstairs to go change and passing his class and just, like, sitting down and, like, catching a ball that for 20 minutes and half an hour before I moved on and changed. And finally, when I knew the show was going to happen, I approached him, I waited for his class to finish. And I walked up on him and I was like, Ray, uh, you, you don't know me, but um, I always watch your class and I think you're amazing. And, uh, and I'm having this show and I would love to invite you to be a part of this show. And he's surprised, he doesn't really know me. Uh, I think he was aware that I taught there. He couldn't understand why I would be interested in him, but he was, he was excited. And it, he was intrigued, I should say. Um, and he came to the first rehearsal, and it was the first day that everybody was meeting. So, you know, and you got all these different personalities, right? So you got, like, Jason Janice, who is out to prove to the world that he can. Yes, I can. I belong, and I'm here for a reason. And, you know, I couldn't wait to hire Jason because I knew that he was going to work his butt off. He was gonna work harder than everybody, and that kind of energy is contagious. So I was excited about that. So you got Jay in there first, kind of like going off. And you got Joseph Wiggin, who's silent, but speaks volumes with his feet and his presence. And so he comes in kind of nonchalantly and just starts hitting, you know? And then you got Jumani, 
who at the time had the crazy long dreads and he came in and he, you know, Jumani's one of the people who I didn't have any relationship with. Joseph, I'd known since he was a kid. We kind of, in some ways, grew up together because we came from the same studio. So that was like, fam. Jason Janis, I had recently developed a strong relationship with as a result of being invited to Texas and that whole thing. And so all of these various levels of relationships were happening. And um, when Jumani came in, he sees what Joseph is doing and he's in instantly. So now you have Joseph and Jumani who don't really have a relationship, who don't know each other, but instantly plug in. And then Jason, who refused to be outworked by anybody who plugs in. So a cipher starts without introducing anybody, without saying anybody's name. We're kind of coming in day one, checking in, putting bags down. A cipher's already going on. We're in. And um, Jared comes, and you know, Jared accepts a, a challenge. You know, he's like, he can't wait for the challenge. So when he gets there, he sees what's going on. He starts strapping up. Well... And, you know, the same goes for J. Sam comes and hype. He recognizes it already and goes nuts. And Brill and Trey come in and they go nuts. And it's just like the level just goes from this small fire to this forest fire of rhythm and excitement and crazy. And then Ray Hesselink comes in. And he's coming in from taught this class, barely know this guy, don't know what this show's about, why does he want me? opens the door and it's like a kung fu movie <laughs> tap nuttiness going down and Ray's like close the door <laughs> Derek can I speak to you <laughs> what am I doing here <laughs> why do you want me and I'm like no Ray you're perfect wait till these cats see you you're gonna change everything and I just knew his contribution would be huge even if he couldn't see it yet I just knew that these guys love the dance so much that when they see what he brings to the table, they're just going to take it and run with it. And I think that it's why Imagine Tap has a chance, even though it's been so long since the last time we saw it. Because those philosophies, the messages, um, the ideas that I try to create that Imagine Tap is are timeless. Um, and the need for inclusion is just as prevalent now as it was back then. Um, it's a show that everybody could go and see themselves in. And I know firsthand from growing up in show business, you watch shows like Black and Blue where, you know, it's everybody's favorite, but, you know, such and such couldn't be in it because they weren't black. And you always hear these stories from the dancers, oh, I couldn't be in it. But it was cool, but I couldn't be in it because I wasn't, you know, noise funk, I wasn't a guy, so I couldn't, I wasn't black, I wasn't, you know, so there's always these this asterisk next to the show. It was a great show, but, you know, I couldn't be in it, so it was all right, you know. I try to create a show that everybody could sit down and see and say, one day I want to be in that, and that could be a reality. Right now, I have this project in mind where I have five of my favorite choreographers who I'm trying to get choreographed solos on me. So they'll, it'll be like their perspective of who I am. And then I'll have a one man show and they'll all be choreographed. It won't be very much, unless their choreography lends itself to me improvising inside of it. It won't be about me getting up there just, you know. In, in your quest to be the best you can be as an artist, I think it's easy to lose sight of the joy and the experience that is tap dance from a fan's perspective, from an audience perspective. The, just the joy in witnessing somebody who is in love with what they're doing and is honest with what they're doing and, and who is vulnerable and willing to share whatever is going on in their spirit at that time with you um, openly. Uh, I think that uh, it's easy to lose sight of that and to get so deep into yourself that you can no longer celebrate the other selves that are around you. I feel like my process growing up, I've always been in the wings watching my whole life. And I've always been excited about being on stage. And I get a kick out of seeing cats in the wings watching and just the irony of that switch after having been a kid for so long watching.